Uh, the uh, title uh, was initially longer. I couldn't fit it in the slides, so I used um, uh, HI, that's uh, human intelligence, to make it fit. Uh, and uh, there are some of my disclosures. Uh, moving on, medical imaging uh, crosses all major specialties and is uh, vital uh, for modern uh, healthcare delivery. Uh, so with that, um, I think it's important to note that AI is uh, transforming our specialty in terms of focusing uh, today on predominantly the clinical translation of those uh, computational methods and looking at the fact that we have a number of interfaces of the technology with the patient, with the operator, and with the physicians. And um, this represents an AI uh, target-rich environment. Uh, furthermore, I think uh, we should focus also or have some attention as to what we're focusing these technologies to achieve. Uh, one of the key words is standardization uh, to push the um, accuracy and precision of the results of the use of these technologies uh, and consider that numerous uh, publications over many years consistently show that errors uh, in healthcare um, are common, uh, too common. Uh, and they, for example, in this study have been attributed to be the third leading cause of, um, of death after uh, heart disease and cancer. Uh, it's uh, associated with a large cost of $17 billion in the U.S. And uh, more broadly, um, estimated to uh, represent a $1 trillion cost in the U.S. when you consider uh, all uh, life uh, quality factors. So uh, with that, uh, focus at the Houston Methodist, we have the Translational Imaging Center within our department uh, with a number of um, uh, cores and the science that uh, they drive in MRI and molecular preclinical and the cyclotron GMP, but with a new core that's been uh, developed uh, on AI. And uh, note that today I'll touch on uh, elements at a we'll say a high level. Uh, nevertheless, I will touch on acquisition, uh, image reconstruction, interpretation, and analysis. Uh, and uh, in this order, I'll review detection, classification, prediction, image improvement, and scanner improvement as uh, major domains of um, uh, focus or impact. Uh, starting with chest x-rays and CTs, because the lung uh, is the most commonly imaged area, so I'll pick what's common. It also happens to be where um, AI systems have been um, really most um, uh, prominent. Uh, and look at lung nodules and pleura. Here's an example. Uh, there are many publications coming out showing uh, very uh, encouraging results in terms of compared to a human reader. Uh, and in this case, as you can see in the um, source uh, image on the left, uh, it's a difficult scan to read, uh, and the computer uh, program correctly predicted a pneumothorax where you see the red coloration. Let's see if this will work. Uh, this is an interesting approach uh, and increasingly being uh, developed where the, uh, a, the neural network is trained to detect what's normal and subtract it, making it much easier even for non-radiologists here to see nodules. And trust me, when we see uh, nodules, uh, they're often common, uh, and they're common and multiple, and uh, busy radiologists uh, can easily miss these. Uh, not only that, but it's an interesting approach from the neural network and training uh, approach. If you have one uh, uh, phase of uh, training to identify or be able to uh, more um, uh, um, effectively extract the pathology like you see on the left, you now can apply another neural network to analyze that pathology, for example, looking for features that differentiate cancer from non-cancerous lesions. And there are a lot of studies now coming out showing uh, how uh, AI is improving over, or at least a non-inferiority measure, but beyond that, even improving on the performance of uh, a professional uh, reader, a radiologist. And uh, another example, of uh, some predictive uh, uh, calculations. Uh, here the model is um, 
making a prediction of the probability of a cancer in these chest x-rays. And what's interesting is these are both examples where the initial read uh, didn't detect any abnormality. So really there's an opportunity, not just for standardization, but really for driving the performance of our imaging systems. Looking at classification, I'll take two examples, one acute and one chronic, uh, stroke and cancer. Uh, here, uh, consider that in a stroke, so that's when there's an occlusion, uh, a blood clot affecting flow to the brain, time is brain, the clock is ticking every minute, truly every second counts. And what we're trying to do is determine if a patient is or is not a candidate to be taken up to the neurointerventional suite where we can use a, uh, a non-surgical interventional method to extract the clot. But you have to make sure that there's no hemorrhage, that it's not too big a occlusion and too big as an ischemic area, which would exclude the patient. We use imaging to differentiate a good candidate from a, a non-candidate. There have been major organizations in radiology that have put out challenges to develop AI solutions. And I'll just show you um, some of uh, where we are with that. So this is an excellent paper summarizing uh, two key points. One, there is a, a large number of large databases uh, for the programmers here to access. In brain, uh, that's probably the largest uh, uh, databases that we have are brain uh, MRs and CTs, uh, from which uh, now a number of companies are spinning off FDA-approved uh, products. So this is a very uh, exponentially rapidly evolving uh, area of clinical translation. And these are several companies that are reviewed in detail in this paper. I'll just summarize uh, here what um, they're able to achieve. In the middle uh, panel, you can see an angiogram. Uh, the system has automatically detected uh, a large vessel occlusion, or what we call an LVO. Uh, this is a different patient on the left, but just an example where a hemorrhage is identified. If we see hemorrhage, that excludes the, per the patient from uh, uh, an extraction. And the image on the right is looking at the perfusion at risk uh, tissue, which also defines criteria for selectivity. And uh, the, the, uh, this is uh, just an example of another FDA-approved product uh, looking at the perfusion and the occlusion. Uh, but moreover, uh, the results are uh, highly interpretive and distributable in, uh, in devices like handhelds because the team looking after the patient is not sitting there uh, waiting. They're distributed in a health organization. They may be in different locations, and they have to be sort of tasked to do a quick verification of what the AI is detecting, and then a call to arms, as it were, to activate the room and get uh, the patient up there. Remember, every minute counts. Uh, the results, uh, I'll, I'll just say in that paper you can re reference, um, has uh, shown a significant improvement in care of stroke. So that's already a, a, an excellent maturing uh, translational uh, high impact area for AI. In cancer, I'll just refer, there are numerous uh, examples. I'm just picking one uh, from the UCLA group that shows that AI performs as well as experienced radiologists in detecting prostate cancer. The reason I picked this areas because prostate MRI is the basis for detecting cancers, and it's, it's very challenging. It's, um, uh, I would say, moderately challenging to get excellent quality imaging and very challenging to do the diagnosis. Use of AI is a way to drive up what uh, is uh, uh, an area that's going to become increasingly important in screening and triaging cancer, much like we do today with breast cancer. Um, and the early evidence is very supportive for uh, high impact, positive impact of AI. Prediction, uh, looking at trajectory of disease. This is uh, work I did with uh, colleagues in Laval and McGill, uh, where the principle, I think, is the point here, because um, the objective is to take a early uh, imaging study and predict what is going to happen to that patient during an acute disease process. In this case, this was in the height of COVID, so of course we were looking at COVID chest x-rays, and the proof of principle uh, was shown in, in, in the data that uh, one could differentiate, for example, worse versus improvement. 
the top left uh, scan is at presentation, and the bottom uh, right is four days later, and the objective is to predict before four days occurs that this person was going to get worse so that you can tailor the therapy. You can see how massively impactful that will be across numerous diseases, and this is work that um, we're actually extending with uh, Gua Balakrishnan. I'm sorry, I have to read your last names. <laughs> too many syllables for my simple mind, and Ashok Viraraganpa. So we're, we're looking at um, an ICU uh, uh, application for this approach, which I think um, could be very uh, productive, and we have some uh, startup grant to pursue that. There's uh, a, a lot of interest in breast screening. The, to be able to extract the full value of mammography and MRI uh, will, uh, you know, as it is now there are numerous large studies that show that the value uh, of MR of uh, mammography um, is is right at the borderline, and I believe that the way to push the value proposition of screening for breast uh, will come from the implementation of computational systems, and the evidence for that is growing rapidly. I've just shown uh, two publications here. Um, and I believe my slides will be made available later. I've been given very little time, so I'm going to go quickly. But just know that this is a, a, a fast-brewing area. Uh, again, very high impact. Improving images. I'll look at MRI. That, I think, is, is really the prototype. And we had an excellent presentation earlier from our colleague from Austin. I'll just um, uh, you know, build on what he presented. But looking at denoising, artifact elimination, faster scanning, new kinds of scanning, uh, to make the point uh, from a clinical side. And uh, here's an example of uh, image on the left. And if you look at the zoom uh, image panel at the top of the slide, you'll see it's blurry. So this scan could have been done at, say, and it was around a two millimeter uh, within plane resolution, which is quite good if it was real. But it's not. It's impaired by artifacts, artifacts that come from Nyquist undersampling, so when you get to an edge on MR, the way it works is that it can reconstruct the image and create this repeating uh, banding. Um, and uh, also motion can create a similar artifact. Using neural network training, the artifact can be identified and eliminated. Also denoising and improving uh, uh, the um, uh, blurring or reducing blurring by denoising is also being used in this data set. This is a, a, a highly impactful application in MR. And I'm just showing you in arrows there. Those are the bands. And those, that's the, the round uh, gray is over some gas. And that is the noisy side. And you can see how now it's essentially denoised on the right image. Um, uh, speed. Let's see if this will run. It was uh, a moment ago. OK. So, uh, left image is a highly undersampled data set. This is the heart um, beating the heart. Uh, so we want to image fast for a number of reasons. Uh, and the ground truth is on the right. And this is a reconstruction uh, image with the data that was derived from the left image. This concept of using less to get more is uh, something we've been working on through other methods, our speaker from uh, Austin made a point to compress sense, which one of my colleagues is actually one of the originators of that technology, still very valuable uh, to us. Uh, but neural networks is taking this to a whole other level of uh, acceleration potential. Um, and then our own work in this domain, uh, again, is just one of uh, many uh, publications in this area. We're using uh, neural networks uh, to do things that essentially are going to are, will and have been transforming uh, certain important attributes of MR from theoretical or research into clinical domain. One of the things about MR is that it's a qualitative uh, imaging tool generally, but it intrinsically is quantitative. And, the, and uh, for those of you who understand CT, for example, that's considered a quantitative output. We look at Hounsfield units. MR uh, now has the potential of becoming quantitative because of um, uh, significant orders of magnitude acceleration potential uh, using AI methods. And that's just an example of what we call mapping 
uh, with super high resolution acquired within a clinically very feasible uh, one and a half to three minutes. Uh, and I believe this will have transformative impact. This is another example with radiation planning. This is um, now using the uh, generative uh, networks, also uh, was uh, previously explained in detail. I'll just uh, point out an example. Uh, image on the left is the source image. Image on the right is a synthetic CT derived from uh, uh, MR. Uh, you'll see in the green uh, space in the middle, that's a tumor. MR shows tumors, CT does not. You use the MR to define the target for radiation, but the radiation physicist uses the CT to calculate the dose. In this case, we save a scan, uh, time and money, by not having to get the second scan. We'll just synthesize it, which is you know, really mind-boggling, actually, if I may uh, use the term. And uh, further, we think that this can be revolutionary in MR uh, using generative adversarial networks to generate different scans from a parent scan. Understand that we use different sequences, like a histologist uses different stains. Uh, each stain generates information, each sequence generates information that's distinct. The ability to synthesize a different stain or sequence from a parent stain or sequence is, uh, is proven uh, um, possible in some of the early work using uh, uh, generative uh, networks, and I believe this is uh, going to evolve and, and have a, a massive impact, potentially taking very long scans and making them much faster. An hour scan, potentially done as fast as a CT scan. And so I'll finish on improving the scanner on just that point, and automation is a key. We've done a lot of work over now a couple of decades working with manufacturers to develop a push button or driverless scanner Taking the operator as a source of variability, we have a shortage of technologists in this country and around the world, especially skilled technologists. MRI is an extremely complicated device. That's its Achilles heel. Simplification through neural networks and automation, the driverless car, we've got six million car accidents per year. If we can reduce that to you know, some smaller number, uh, huge impact. Same thing with uh, uh, MR. And just to show some of the things you can also derive once you start to assess uh, things that are happening while the patient's on the scanner, like they're breathing, hopefully, uh, we can analyze that and derive uh, things uh, that relate to lung motion. And from lung motion, we can derive calculations of elasticity and compliance, which even gets us down to things about how aeration is occurring. We can also do flow measurements of blood in the MR and we can get down to some information that before was just you know, very theoretical. It's now feasible. Know this on my final note, in conclusion, there's a huge business that's uh, driving AI development with over 500 new companies in the last few years. Uh, the FDA is uh, trying to figure out how to handle these. We know that there's some very important technology that's not getting through the FDA. When it comes out to us, to a user like myself, I get calls every week from companies. Um, and we need a, uh, a, 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 a growth in a technology to assess these technologies. Uh, and so, uh, you know, to get to the imaging uh, a device, the driverless MRI, uh, it, it's, it's actually been impeded by not having the capacity to help the FDA understand what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and overall, I think as uh, um, in terms of healthcare, uh, we need to develop that capability. So I'll conclude there and thank you again for the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you, Diego. We have time for maybe one question. One quick question. Okay, John. A really great presentation. I was just wondering in your experience, uh, how are clinicians and kind of the end user adapting to these different types of technologies? Oh, I'm on. Uh, so uh, that's a broad question. Uh, and um, I suspect it, you, you're obviously in the field, so it may have a rhetorical element. You know, it's going to be um, broad, right? So you, it depends who is it. Um, the radiologist? <laughs> is it another clinician? A radiologist, of course, the concern is they're going to be out of a job. I think that's absurd. 
um, the um, administrator. Administrators are trying to figure out, you know, everybody comes with their favorite uh, new AI. You know, I need this, I need this. So if they were to get contracts with all of them, it would, it would uh, drive uh, health systems broke. So, um, you know, I think it, it, that is, you just asked a huge question that absolutely merits a closer exam. Let's thank Diego again. So our next speaker is...